Okay, first of all, it will say notes because uh, as uh, some of you know, there's a, there was or is supposed to be a science symposium. I'm not sure what the current status is, uh, but it's been, I, I, got, I heard that's been changed. Yes. Yes. Okay, so, uh, so what I had intended to do was to have a um, more of a conversation because I've been thinking about uh, things that, points I'd like to make for that event. Um, but I still think it's useful to rehearse, in fact, it's even more important, I think, to rehearse some of these points here tonight, uh, because I, I know I won't be able to say everything. I want to say all the rants I have about artificial intelligence in that, particular, that event. But these are notes. I don't have a lecture or a paper to deliver, all right? Um, and I've been, but I've been collecting thoughts about this kind of topic for quite a while. And I also want to mention that, uh, that I, as an editor of AI in Society, um, which is published by Springer, I'd like to um, make a call out to any one of you who would like to make a very short, very, very punchy uh, uh, thousand word, you know, a few pages, a couple of pages, thousand word um, uh, pointed remark about any aspect of technology and society. Uh, about which you know maybe there's a received wisdom or there might be some uh, bit of hoopla about, uh, but you think should be taken down, <laughs> couple of notches. Uh, we call this uh, the, the editors. Which I'm one of the two editors of that special column inside the journal AI and Society. Uh, I should give you a first a little backup. Oh, it's called Curmudgeon's Corner, <laughs> and we are all curmudgeons. Okay, at what of, of any age. I think here in the EGS, we can be we're well prepared to be curmudgeons, but it's meant to be constructive. Um, and um, the journal AI and Society, and you, may, you may not know it, but it's called AI and Society because, in fact, it was founded about 25 years ago by Karamji Gill um, in the United Kingdom. Uh, he founded it with the assistance of some of the major figures in artificial intelligence in that time. Uh, and you can just look at the masthead to see the names of those people. One of my advisors was involved with this, at Terry Winograd at Stanford University. And uh, I asked uh, Karamji when he invited me to be a, become a member of the board, so why are you inviting me? Because uh, it's not my area. I don't do that kind of work. In fact, you know. And anyway, I, I also do work with arts and movement and stuff like that, but I do use computers. And he said, um, he said the journal is uh, very reputable. It's, one, it's the main AI journal in Springer. And uh, it has you know, bona fide computer scientists, etc. But he said that the function of the journal, the role of the journal, is to provide a forum for anyone who has something important to say um, about technology and society, but has no place to say it, a place that has authority to say it. So, wow, OK, count me in. So that was great. And I really, really respect the board tremendously. Um, to give you an idea, one of the, I guess now it's an honorary um, uh, emeritus board member is Mike Cooley, C-O-O-L-E-Y. I highly recommend this person, uh, Mike Cooley. I told you it's going to be a rehearsal. I'm not prepared for the lecture notes. Uh, Mike Cooley, uh, give you some idea, is, um, self, is a self-taught engineer. He's still alive. He's probably in his 90-something now. Self-taught engineer. He, uh, he, in the 1970s, he was a principal engineer for Lucas Aerospace. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Lucas Aerospace company. It's defunct. But that was the British uh, partner to the French company that made the assist the Concorde, the supersonic transport. And it was one of the big miracles, right, of the mid-century of technology. Uh, and he was the lead for that company. And then uh, after, oh, I don't know, about a decade, I guess, the company was in danger of going bankrupt. They're going to close the company because there's no, not much business for supersonic airplanes even then. And the engineers, uh, not just engineers, all the employees of the company decided to take matters into their own hands. And they went out to their own communities in the United Kingdom and said, hey, you know, we're very smart people. We know how to make anything. What do you want? What do you need? 
And the communities came back to them with all sorts of ideas. I don't know what they were. I mean, like better wheelchairs or make the make the buses run on time or whatever. They came back with all, and they did the whole business plan, soup to nuts. It wasn't just the object, the, the devices. Actually, every how to make it all make a profit. You know, to make a sustainable business out of these different kinds of ideas. They talk, took all these ideas back to the directors, and directors turned them down, and they closed the company. So, but he wrote this up, uh, and then later on, he was the, invited to the London Greater London Council, the first and maybe only uh, major left government ruling, ruling directing London during that time. He was invited as the chief scientist to advise him, chief technology officer to advise London how to bring the city up to computer age. Uh, West Germany, uh, Sweden, the, the prime minister of Sweden, etc., engaged him. European leaders engaged him in the subsequent decades to be the chief technology advisor for their nations to bring the nations into the contemporary computer age, et cetera, et cetera. He self-taught. He wrote a book called Architect or B, which I highly recommend. Uh, Architect or B. Uh, about <coughs> automation, about automation, and about about automation and about the computerization of skills, about the, um, the, about the uh, attempt to, um, to modularize the tacit knowledges and, and, and in fact, explicit knowledges of engineers and, and, well, craftsmen, tradesmen, into computer models and then trying to modularize that and deliver that modular information in stratified, um, into stratified, uh, let's say, skill sectors, okay? Et cetera, et cetera. He wrote this book uh, many decades ago, and some of us think it really deserves much wider attention here, especially in this age. Okay, um, okay so there's that. So um, I'm going to go through a few notes. It's in the form of an outline. I, I hope this doesn't get broadcast too widely, because it's in the form of an outline. I would really like to have some conversations with you so that I can turn it into a more formal presentation, maybe in two days from now. We'll see. Uh, um, but it, I, I do want to make sure I, 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 get, I strike the right notes with it, OK? So there will be three parts to it, plus a fourth part, which would be kind of like, you know, and uh, where do we go from here? So the first part is about the, um, the uh, challenge to thought, to, let's say, our notions of thought by algorithm, me mechanical procedures for dealing with symbols, let's say. Uh, another is the, um, in each case, the line means replace or augment, OK? So the second would be the replacement or augmentation of gesture by mechanism. Um, and the third would be the replacement or augmentation, in this case, replacement, I should say. Okay, augmentation of organism by golem. It's okay. So, a thought versus algorithm. So there are two parts to that. <laughs> the first part is uh, what is the digital representation? You know, how do we? How how does a computer actually represent anything? You know, in in its memory. And this talk will be progressively less detailed. <laughs> for the for the so I think it's very important to. It would be very important to kind of understand, you know, what's going on to demystify uh, some of the, some of what's going on. The second would be, um, okay, given the representation, the digital form, what does the computer do with it? Which would be algorithm. What is an algorithm? How does the algorithm work? And so, in terms of, there are two main papers that people should be referring to, right? And kind of obvious, uh, in you know, if you know the area, the history of computation. In terms of representation, it would be this famous paper, right? This legendary paper by Claude Shannon called A Mathematical Theory of Communication. Many people cite it, not as many people read it. <laughs> and of course, it's, but I mean, I finally got around to reading it this past year, and I was really blown away. I was really impressed. I'm really impressed by this person. Because I, I, by, I was form, by formation, I was kind of biased in two different ways. One is that as a mathematician, mathematicians look down on engineers, <laughs> okay? And they say, oh, there's nothing they can say. The other thing is that, you know, politically, of course, there's all these, you know, PC ways to, to kind of like 
sneer at the, the person who, who actually destroyed you know, representation and language. And but if you look at this particular paper, uh, he's actually extremely mathematical. It's actually written with, from a mathematician's point of view, actually, which was dropped by most of the uses of this kind of formalism in subsequent generations. Okay, so first of all. Uh, the second is, he, also, he was also a very interesting, useful, he was also a very, uh, how do you say, I would say a wise scientist. Because scientists who are wise, they actually know very well, they think very carefully about the limits of their, um, of their um, object, the definition of the objects of study, and the limits of the modes by which they, propo they propose to study those objects. Okay. They're extremely acutely conscious, and the ones who are more experienced are even are quite subtle. Okay, so we want to pay respect to to, to respect that. In his case, and you'll see uh, how this goes. So I want to go through a few moments of this paper. Okay, so I, uh, okay, this will be progressively less detailed, but these first parts are, are quite important, I think, to get right. Um, so you look at the yellow. Yes, if you look at the highlighted parts, it's extremely important. Right away, in the second paragraph, he says explicitly that the fundamental problem for engineers of communication is uh, reproducing at one point uh, the message that was constructed at another point. Okay. And he says, frequently, the messages have meaning. Okay, and he's not <laughs> frequently. <laughs> not always. And he even italicizes it. Okay. And uh, that is the refer this is what he means by meaning. Okay. That is, they refer to or are correlated according to some system with certain physical or conceptual entities. He allows already conceptual entities. Great. Okay, it's not just physical. Um, and these semantic aspects of communication are irrelevant <laughs> to the engineering <laughs> problem. <laughs> it's great. He says it. It's irrelevant. And then he moves on. So this is great. So I suggest we all refer to this. Whenever we get debates with people, say, oh, computers are going to tell us how to use language. OK. <laughs> OK, so I can, we're finished. We could go home. <laughs> but then it goes on, and then he studies the formal problem, formal problem of how to define what he calls information content. And this is not, as we were doing in the seminar, what Simon Don calls information. Okay. The other is this very famous diagram, okay, uh, which is, and then, okay, well, uh, which he says explicitly in the paper, in this essay, that he extra abstracts from the telegraph. He says the word telegraph is in there, right? It's not some historian's uh, imagination, it's right in this essay, okay? So this is an engineer's, or engineer, the electrical engineer, applied mathematicians, conscious uh, um, abstraction from a given electrical technology called the telegraph. So there is a da -da 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 on one side, a wire, physical wire, and somebody listening to a microphone on the other side. That's all it is. So it's a very short step from the mechanical uh, instantiation to the, to the diagram. That's it. It's very, you know, it's a step. It's just a step. So you have a source. You have a, you have a source. Uh, device that sends it into a wire, there's a wire, and there's a way to encode the signal. In, some, in the Morse code sense, it's just a dot or a sign, it's a dot or a sign. Okay. And it's very nice because as a good scientist, right, he puts a noise right at the, right the get-go, unlike a computer scientist. In computer science, we never consider noise, <laughs> except as a table, lookup table for pseudo-random numbers. So he's a good scientist here. Um, and this is also interesting when he talks about entropy. And he explicitly uh, uh, says that he's getting it from physics, from statistical physics. Okay. And he's explicitly modeling this definition from physics, actually, from thermodynamics, right there. And it's not so important the details here, except to note that he has one, two, three. He's, uh, he's uh, axiomatically deriving the existence of such a function. Okay, don't worry about the details, but I just want to give you the sense of the way of thought. It's very different from the way engineers are taught to do, think today. Because he was thinking as a mathematician. So he was saying, we want a function, we don't know what it is yet, a function that has such and such properties. 
and the function needs to have such and such properties uh, in order to, uh, what does he say here? To be able to handle probabilities of occurrence of certain events, okay? Properties such as it should be continuous in the probabilities. This is how mathematicians talk. It's not how engineers think. And then, in a, somewhere down the end of the paper, he proves the existence of such a, such a function. Okay. Of course, he knows, he knows they exist because he knows his friends in physics are using such things. Goes on. So there's something mystical okay, okay, about this kind of thing. And in fact, it's unique. That, that is interesting. It's the only function that has to satisfy those kinds of properties. It goes on from there. Okay. Now, I jump to the very end. Okay, then there's all this stuff about log and entropy and information. But what's super interesting, and that was surprising to me, was at the very end, in the last section, section 18, he talks about continuous signals. I was just blown away. I had no idea it's in there. Did you know that? That Shannon treated not just digital signals, he treated continuous signals, the analog world. So the god of discrete computation was considering analog world from the in the founding paper. Okay? And it's worth looking at the words. Okay? Uh, I don't know if I have the rest of this. Oh, do I? Good, good, good. Okay. Na, 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 na. I don't know if I have the, the preface to this part. But he says at the outset, it gives them sample, some examples of, of what he thinks, uh, uh, motivated examples for continuous signal. Look at the yellow part. Human speech, English speech, okay. And he says off right away, he says right away that, um, uh, that he doesn't have the mathematics for it, actually, okay. And look at the examples of human speech. He says uh, the analogous problems that, uh, that he wants to treat analogous problems, which is again, looking at the, some formal properties which is like probability of occurrence of certain bits of speech, right? Um, so, is that, so that's what we're talking about, probability measure. But as soon as you talk about the analog domain, and as soon as you're talking about continua, okay, continuous signals, you can no longer use counting measures, you know, how many dots are there versus non-dots, et cetera, et cetera, right? How many ones versus how many integers have been received. And so we don't have the same mathematics, actually. Okay. But he's tried, he makes the beginning of an attempt to, 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 to model these kinds of things using ergodic theory. He explicitly cites such, such mathematics. And now those areas are much more developed. Okay. But I think I just wanted to point out that he was actually making a, a strong um, uh, division between the uh, formal techniques that could be adequate to understanding digital signals and the formal techniques that would be needed to deal with analog signals in which included human speech. Okay, so that's, look, I'll, I'll, I'll work on it some more and I'll bring back more, okay, consequences from that part. So this is in terms of representation, okay. The second part is after we do have representations coded up, uh, in this case, so we already set aside meaning, we set aside semantics, we have what's left, and we set aside analog, we set aside continua, then we reduced, very, very, very much reduced to just digital signals. Once we have representations in that form, zeros and ones, what can we do with them? So this is where algorithm, algorithm comes up. And I'm sorry if I bore people who've seen this many times before, but it's extremely important to understand clearly what's meant by computation. Because there's so much uh, hype around it, especially today. So by computation, we mean the set of procedures that can be, um, that are, in fact, um, uh, deterministically uh, um, uh, controlled by algorithm. And then we say, what is an algorithm? Okay. So this is the famous, uh, this goes back to Turing. So this is the other seminal um, um, construction or model, okay, which is the Turing's model of computation by any by an algorithm. And it's very simple. I mean, this model here, okay? You strip it down. Oh, punchlines exposed. Okay, don't see punchlines. So uh, the Turing, of course, Alan Turing was another genius, right? So he, but he tried to strip things down to think about the simplest possible uh, machine that was also universal enough to uh, implement any 
uh, algorithm, algorithm, any in this class of uh, mechanizable um, logic, okay? Uh, and the basic machine is, has a tape, right? It has tape, and then this reader can see one cell at a time. The cell can be uh, written on, and it can it contain one or a finite number of characters. It's written for a finite number, okay? A through Z or zeros or ones. And then the machine also has something called a state. It exists in a certain state, okay? State one, state two, state three, or state beginning, state middle, state end, whatever. You can name the states whatever you want, okay? And depending on what it sees, and depending on what state it's in, it has a table that tells it what to do. What can it do? It can uh, print, overwrite the character in that tape, then decides to move left or right, Instruction will tell it to move left or right and change its state. Okay? And that's what this table is. Okay, if you're in state, uh, yeah, if you're in state A, you see a zero, you look down, it's one right arrow B. Meaning print one, go to the right one step, change your state to B. That's it. That's it. All algorithms are equivalent to this. All computational digital algorithms are equivalent to this. All of them. Okay? And all computers, digital computers, are Turing equivalent. They're equivalent to this machine. Of course, a lot more efficient. Okay? That's it. There's nothing mystical about these things. Okay? So everything else, like deep belief networks or dream or whatever, they're just marketing. Okay? So 50 years of research research is just trying to make things more and more efficient. That's it. Here's an example of a Turing of a program. Written, this is actually, I'm going to redo it so it matches the program up here. But in any case, so another way to represent the program that, this is the program up on the upper left, a little matrix, okay, uh, is to write in the form of a graph, okay? So, uh, so for example, instead of the labels Q0, Q1, Q2, it would be A, B, C, right? So to make it match up with the previous diagram, so it'd be like maybe it's in state uh, B, and then you see some input, and you, you can measure, you can say, if you're in state B, and when you go to state A, it's like drawing an arrow from B to A, so it's state A, and along the way, do something. So you are label that arrow with uh, print zero move right. Okay, uh, so the arrows will be labeled that way. So basically, any program can be represented in the form of, I'm sorry to keep adjusting, so any program can be written in the form of such a graph. Okay? So I'm going really deliberately just to emphasize these are very mundane representations. Any program. So all the vast and very creative work on programming language design. Actually, I'm very interested in that. Okay? They're just ways to make it more amenable, different ways to make it for people to write programs so that machines can execute them. I've actually written programs in this format myself. And for certain purposes, it's the most efficient way to think, actually, how to program something. If you're going to program like a little mouse click or sensor or something like that, that's sometimes a better way to, than to code it up in C or something like that. Okay. Um, uh, now, in 1728, you know this picture, very famous picture. In around 1728, this is Van Kampen, I think, uh, there was that, oh, I'll give it away, but anyway. You know, there was this famous uh, chess playing machine that went around, toured the courts of Europe. Everybody thought it was amazing because it could beat the pants off or skirts off anybody it came across. Turned out that um, it was um, uh, powered by a human, a little a dwarf who was actually very good at playing chess. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I think, we have the opposite situation today. Right? Well, well somatically we're the same, right? Computers are basically having human proxies inside them to, to, uh, to animate them. But instead, it's actually very likely the opposite. This is why I sent the quote out from Simon Dome uh, two days ago when I was preparing for the seminar. And in this one passage, Simon Dome, while he was criticizing the cybernetic model of thought, he said that bringing together the logical structure of functioning of systems independently of the study of their concrete individuation, you know, what are they made of, you know, 
is it vacuum tubes or not, leads purely and simply to identifying the system study, that is living, social, and so on, with automatons, capable only of adaptive behavior. Okay? By adaptive, you actually just mean mechanically adaptive. Okay? So uh, when I finish this presentation, not today, I'm going to talk about pattern recognition. So a lot of the work on so-called work on AI today, I'm being very, my, my tone is not very respectful, so I should change my tone. <laughs> but you know, but this idea about, um, because I don't think we should use inflationary terms like artificial intelligence. But in any case, we look at pattern recognition or machine learning, even that's inflationary, but machine pattern recognition, let's say. Um, they're based on what's happened before. They're based on looking at um, data that's been presented from before. They can't, they don't. Um, uh, they, they um, anyway, just leave it at that, okay? So well, the best they can do is adapt, right? The best they can do is, is modify the interior model in the presence of uh, the past, basically. But, now here are some buts, okay? And this is just, oh, I need my notes, hang on. I don't go and order the slides, I should go and order the notes, sorry about that. So here are some caveats having done that. Some caveats. One, one of them is, can I go back? Oh, come on. I want to go back to the cell. To, where's the cell? Here it is. Here. There are many caveats. For example, in this cell, what if, there's no, why do we assume that the cell is single-valued? You know, why do you assume? That, why do we assume? Why, why, it, it's not a necessary assumption. It's just a simplifying assumption that uh, what you're looking at has one definite value. And we know that's that's not the case. Anytime we look at an advertisement or any 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 time any human looks at any sign, right, is multivalent interpretation. Even if we're trying to do something simple like saying, "What is that character?" Are you Chinese or are you, you know, Egyptian? What are you? Uh, these are obvious things, okay? I'm not saying, I hope I'm not saying, you know, but I think it's really important to turn around and talk to people outside this room with these kinds of obvious things. Uh, another is, it, it's not even clear. It may not be clear when it's on the tape. Why are we assuming clarity? If you're, I'm told by electrical engineers that what, what computer scientists think is a bit is actually highly constructed. <laughs> It takes a huge amount of electrical engineering to maintain that illusion for the colleagues in computer science to think that once they change this register to zero, next time they look back, it's going to be a zero again. And they can be sure it's going to be a zero again. There's a huge amount of hiss going on in thermodynamics and lots of machinery underneath that level to guarantee, or to guarantee, to um, often enough that the zero stays at zero. A lot, a lot of electrical engineering goes into that. There's all this physics going on fizzing away, literally fizzing away underneath. It takes a huge amount of technology to maintain that bit as a bit, <coughs> okay? So um, another is, uh, is this question of the distinction between a mark and a substrate. What is the tape and what is the mark on the tape? Uh, how is the system supposed to know that the black part of it is the signal, and the white part is not the signal. And even that assumes that there's something called ink, writing. So this happens to be a watermark. There's no ink at all. This, uh, this is not a watermark. This, uh, what you're reading is a lessening of intensity of the substrate. All right, we can do this. Right? So we should think about implications for this. Um, watermark, oops, watermark is to me fascinating because watermarks means that we can read even when there's no positive trace. Right? We can just vary the intensity of substrate and that's enough. It's not even about a system of marks where the difference, or differences that make the difference. Okay? Not e we don't even need to get there and still we can already 
do something with science. Um, so why is this relevant to computers? Because you see, in computers, we have this notion of signal and noise, right? So above a certain threshold, it becomes signal. Below a certain threshold, it's considered noise, the hiss of electronics. Um, but in, in our work with sensor technologies and explicitly coding what constitutes the threshold, it's a choice. We choose that when we're doing work with gesture tracking, things like that. Uh, I want to show, not tonight, but well, maybe I will, okay, tonight or if I get a chance to do the full thing, what else we can do with computers. So just to say, we actually are doing lots of positive things with computers and computation, but they're just not meant to replace human intelligence, human language, et cetera, or decision-making, none of that. That's to us not the interesting use of computers. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, plus, the state topology, this. Okay, this is actually another profound thing. This is a program. All programs are equivalent to this kind of picture at some point. But there are many things that are limited, too limited, I think, for this model of action. One is that a state is discrete. That you're in the machine, the system is in the state and not in any other state, and there's no other state that's close to the state. It, all states are, in a sense, formally just distinct. And we know that's not true for, for humans, for cultures, for economies. Why should that be true? Also, why is no reason in, in our complexity of life to assume that um, there's, a, there's one state or even a finite number of states that describes what state we're in? Okay. And even in physics, this is not the case. In physics, there's no limit to how many, formally, how many states that can be active, let's say, for a mechanical system. All right. A state can be a sum, in other words, a state can be a sum of other states. Okay. And other, also states can, in our case, states can be overlapping. And states, you can have very gradations of state, degrees of state. Okay. And this, these ideas are what we've been using for now 15 years or so in the compositional techniques for guiding the behavior of rich environment, complex responsive environments. And we saw yesterday in uh, Philip's talk on, on, on this beautiful environment that Philip's been building, uh, various ways to animate such rich environments. Okay? So there are many ways to do this kind of thing. Uh, okay, and furthermore, this topology may vary over time. So, of course, people talk about uh, self-modifying programs and things like that, but somebody has to write the program to modify the program, and those programs are not going to be invariant. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recursion problem. Okay, so there's that. Um, plus, moreover, the tape. The tape is, in this case, considered passive. It doesn't act. Why? There's no reason why that's the case from biology. We know that biological substrates act on themselves. In fact, this notion of substrate is not a passive thing at all. Okay. So the separation between memory, which is this tape, and um, processor, which is this thing up here, that's artificial. Okay. That's not how living systems work. In fact, that's not the only way that computers need to work, that, that machines need to work either. That was a decision. It was an engineering decision at some point, a formal, formal decision. To give you an example, in, I, I, in, the, in, um, in uh, Brussels, there was a research organization called Starlab, which is not defunct. At that point, one of the uh, projects, Blue Sky projects there, was to do fiber computing. Fiber computing, meaning threads woven, uh, woven out of certain kinds of um, semiconductors, where uh, the threads would compute, would change state according to how they were uh, twining around each other. Okay. And this is not the same thing as attaching gadgets on a, a jacket. Okay, not at all. It was much more fundamental. That is, usual uh, semiconductors, right, they have this kind of PNP junctions and things like that. Uh, this thing was not built like that. This was a new kind of electronics, not built like semiconductors, okay, not like that. And they asked me to try to imagine uses for such kind of new kinds of novel devices. Okay, and, but that's another conversation. It's very interesting. So just to point out, there's, there wasn't, there's not like a one path for the evolution of computation, even in the digital domain. Okay. Hey, are there comments now? I mean, this is supposed to be turning more and more into a conversation. So are there questions or comments? OK, these are notes. These are notes. OK, I, there are gaps in between. 
Okay. Uh, there'll be more gaps, it'll be more evident as I go on. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, obvious things I'll skip over, like context. Uh, well, the context problem is obvious to us, but not necessarily obvious. So these are obvious, all right? So context, in, context of interpretation. What is the meaning of a mark? Or even what is the you know, meaning of a signal? Um, this is assumed that you, you can read all that just by looking at the signal, uh, looking only at that mark, okay? And this is shot throughout computer science and engineering. You only need to look at that mark in front of you. Same thing with what is the meaning of this object? I can determine this by looking at this object. So obviously, in this context, it's kind of, uh, it would be considered naive, right? But it's, it is the way that a lot of the engineering or, or product design, et cetera, is, is, is done. If you want to, want to understand uh, a person, a thing, a mark, you only need to look at that person, the thing, or the mark. And then we remind them in computer science that this is known as the context problem in artificial intelligence, that to interpret as a sign on the screen or in an input, uh, the computer scientists knew and know that you need context. And then we say, yes, but then remember, after the, the essay on the origin of geometry, intuition and geometry, you know, after Derrida's interpretation and of Heidegger, we know, we know, that this, this is called the horizon problem. The horizon problem doesn't necessarily have a finite answer. There may be no, in fact, there, I, there is no finite horizon of interpretation, right? We know this. So it's interesting. This, and that, they think, that philosophical point has a direct impact on what's called AI. The context problem has not been solved in AI. And the way that people try to do that is to say, well, just get bigger machines. <laughs> we'll put more context in. But that's not the point, right, of, of, that, of that thing. So furthermore, in an in inactive situation that we talked about in the seminar, inaction, right, embodied, extended, embedded, inactive co-construction of subjects and objects in a, and also subjects in the world, or organism and umwelt, all that, right? These co-construction through inactive procedures, uh, in such situations, in such situations, there is no tape, <laughs> right? There's no tape. It's not like an external, external registry at all. So we're very far away from that situation. And then, so, let me come back to beyond this point. Uh, why is it? Oh, maybe it's timed. That would be bad. I had it timed. Let me get it timed. Okay. And again, this is familiar to us, right? Freud's magic um, mystic writing pad, okay. which is a beautiful idea. So now we enter the domain of what constitutes memory. And I think here we have a lot to say. Not me, you, we, okay, have a lot to say about what different, different ways to think about memory. And here, I'm, I'm, I'm in, in a sense, these are topics for discussion. And maybe I should pause after the thought algorithm section, and we can talk a little bit, and I can take notes, all right? This, because then I would really like to maybe ask for maybe references, ways to make it make the point more obvious to, to people in these uh, other disciplines. Uh, I just put this as a cipher, I mean as an index, because there's a lot of, lot of work we can talk about here. But for example, the status of dreams. So Lisa Solomonova, a mutual friend, uh, has been doing a lot of interesting work um, in Montreal on um, embodiment in dreams, in dream state. The sense how one has, how having a body makes a difference to your experience in dream state. Okay and not thinking of dreams as delusional, of course, or as delusional, but it's just a mode of consciousness. And thinking carefully about how to do the neuroscience and the phenomenology and using contemplative practices together to understand those kinds of experience, okay? So that's, there's a whole body of work around that that could be very, very interesting to bring in here. And then my own contribution for this kind of debate would be uh, that even mathematical thought is not algorithmic even mathematical thought. And um, that's a whole chunk of discussion. And um, I'll just, um, I'll just um, highlight things. OK. So did I talk about this in the seminar about um, the um, Principia Mathematica and Gödel's incompleteness theorems? I probably mentioned it in passing, but not really. Okay. So, 
so people know about this project uh, uh, with Russell and Whitehead at the beginning of the 20th century to formalize mathematics in terms of set theory and logic, right? And it was basically to finally, you know, get a mechanical procedure for doing mathematics. Okay, it's alongside with the beginning of computer science, right? And it was to, and, and they, they wanted to start from, literally from nothing, that is, start from the empty set. Not even zero, but empty set. And they managed to define the integers after a couple hundred pages, and they go on and on and on, derive arithmetic, et cetera. But uh, just around the time when it was completed, Gerdo published his famous incompleteness theorems. And what the incompleteness theorems state is are that, um, roughly, any mathematical theory that contains the integers, one, two, three, four, five, natural numbers, um, actually, in such, a, in such a mathematical theory, you can uh, mechanically, actually, construct a statement uh, that, that is uh, true, provably true, and provably be false. Both true and false. Mechani you, can, you can mechanically construct the statement. Okay. So you can actually grind out some procedure. It would be a very long procedure, uh, but you can do it. Uh, it's amazing. It was just amazing. It was just, it's a, it's one of, I would think it's one of the three um, scientific bombshells of the 20th century. Okay. So it really uh, killed the uh, millennia old uh, dream of a, um, a language in which truth could only lead to truth basically killed it. But unfortunately, uh, we, hear, we see around us people who still believe that it can be done using computers. So I call it zombie thinking. <laughs> you know, the idea's already dead, but still walking, <laughs> still walking around. So I think it's interesting, and that's why, it'd be interesting now to move to the political and say, why is this the case? Why? That's the end of the story. That there are zombie thoughts moving around. Okay, it's kind of obvious. Um, but there are many other things to say about uh, mathematical thought. But the important thing is that, and yet, mathematics continues, because there are many. many in fact, most uh, mathematics is constructed. It's not constructible, or it's not. Um, how do you say? Not finite. First of all, uh, there are many proofs uh, that rely on, for example, what's called an axiom of choice and a transfinite axiom of choice. You can choose among a set. If it's, uh, but if there are infinitely many sets, it's harder to you know, assert how. It can harder to say how you're going to choose. And if there are transfinitely many sets, which we can talk about some, some other time, it becomes an axiom. You have to just say that you can do it. Okay. Um, but then there's whole bodies of mathematics that depend on this, that make the mathematics intuitive and natural to do. Without that, it become unnatural to do. All of these are not computable. Most of mathematical thought is not computable. You can't even represent it in a computer. It's not a matter of memory size. In principle, it's not representable. Okay. And yet, we do mathematics. In fact, we even have physics and engineering based on mathematics, actually. So that's very interesting. Later on, downstream, we'll talk about biology, and there are ways in which biology is not reducible to physics, and certainly not reducible to computation in fundamental ways. But I choose mathematics because people think that mathematics being you know, abstract is kind of the first thing to get computerized. But we know from these theorems that they are, in principle, non-computational and non-algorithmic, in principle. It's interesting. Um, please. <coughs> Like we were talking today, and it got me thinking about this game that I really love. It's called a Dwarf Fortress. And so one of the sort of draws of the game is that it's this incredibly complex world. Like when you restart the game, you're engaging this whole like generative process of creating a world that has like an entire history. Like you can even get like add-ons that create a wiki that lets you browse the history of this world that has been created. And then the game is just very granular in the systems such that it actually like models like even like subcutaneous fat that can get damaged in battle. <laughs> okay. Um, oh god. And so I mean like this game, like it's it's this weird like fever dream of like trying to simulate this total encompassing reality and that's seductive for some reason. Yeah. Like, even though like computers yeah. are so limited and 
yeah. but in their ability to represent reality. Like, what yes. is so seductive about yeah. that dream? Yes. What, what, do you, what do you think? What do, why? Why throw this out to, to everyone? Yes? I don't know. I mean, it maybe has to do with this idea of the, like, what was the theorem and what was happening before it was proved. It's like, very uh, seductive to know that you can prove something as true and be able to not think about it anymore. As opposed to um, being presented with the fact that you can't prove it's true or not. I'm going to the golem at the end. All right, so I'll come back to that. You know, there's a question of proving something true, which is very seductive. Uh, and then this, I think there's more, right? I think, I think we'll come to the figure of the golem. We'll, we'll, we should come back to this. Okay. So the urge to create that. And there are all sorts of reasons. There's not one reason, okay? Um, because, okay we'll get there. Uh, <laughs> pattern recognition. So pattern recognition, the thought, this is all inside the question of thought versus algorithm, okay? So what are a lot of the, the current AI techniques about? They're no longer about natural language processing. They're about pattern recognition or doing statistics, okay? So, uh, so let's call it for what it is, this pattern recognition. And um, I was going to um, go through some of those. OK, when I do this completely, and I know some idea of how much time I have, I will describe explicitly some of the main techniques for doing pattern recognition, right? Such as, you know, uh, support vector machines. That's the base, most simple one, you know, or neural networks, which are actually not neural at all. Actually, they're just sums of piecewise linear functions with coefficients, and you just adapt them by um, p squares descent, uh, um, just descent, just descent methods. You know, it's really not. It's not more than that. In fact, they're very simple nonlinear optimization problems. Okay, etc. Um, more st statistical methods, okay, which are more interesting actually. Okay, so I, I would like to describe those, but I'm going to name them now and step over them. But I think it's important for our project to actually understand how these things work. To again to demystify this box called AI. Okay. All right. So there's that um, pattern recognition. But the key thing I want to point out, though, is like I said before, these are patterns based on the past. Okay. That's it. That's a fundamental limitation. Actually, we can't do potentive intuitions here. Okay. Um, we can do extrapolation, but that's different. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Another issue is, which is more subtle, is this question about, uh, I'll talk about at the end of that time, is this question about evolutionary systems being open-ended, okay? Um, uh, okay, I'll just put that at the end, okay? But the question about thought would be novel thought, fresh thought, new thought, okay? And, and that's, I think, the interesting part. And the observation should be that algorithms don't give us that. They can give us um, permutations and combinations, but an algorithm cannot give us this kind of, I claim that they cannot give us these kinds of proliferations of thought in the sense of poetry. Okay, this is just a, 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 um, if you say, a bookmark, and we have to come back to that. Okay. So this is a section on, um, on uh, and thought and algorithm. So maybe take pause a little bit to talk about this. There's some questions about algorithms and thoughts, and especially this last claim, you know, about novelty and the thought. Maybe fleshing that out a little bit. Because that's a big jump right there. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe just addressing your uh, one claim previously that, uh, that it's no new, that the that, that algorithm can generate no new thoughts. Um, how do you compare that to something like, for instance, uh, I don't know, um, William Burroughs' like cut hmm. method of hmm. poetry, and how that juxtaposition of already past texts somehow creates new thought, or if it does? That's a good point. Or any Ulipo, right? Any Ulipian techniques, things like that. It's combinatorial exercises from the Ulipo school. And, and he, okay, now putting on artist hat, speaking as artist. So don't you think, I mean, if, if you've done these exercises yourself, for the purpose of, for artistic purpose, all right? For artistic purpose, you know, if you're a writer or if you're a composer, um, these kinds of techniques, they, they, um, they start the process. That's it. They start the creative process. I mean, if there are artists in this room, we should talk about it. Because for me, 
uh, these kinds of experiments are kind of breaking log jams. If I'm stuck, I don't have an idea, so let's go do a mechanism so I don't have to think about it, you know, things like that. But, um, but they're very, very far from actually making the work. Very far. It's like step zero, and just out of 99 steps. Um, yes? Yes, but that's for that person. He made he made in other words a particular method for for himself, and that's it. But I'm talking about you know the, the field of writers, the community of writers, the community of composers, dancers. Okay, if I'm looking at you know people who not just people but communities, the people who are composers and choreographers and writers and musicians, and look at. And this will have to do also come back to this question of hypostatization of certain techniques, such as search and database. But so those are, that's a very particular case. One person, one technique. Henri Michaud, to take another writer. Henri Michaud, sorry, uh, Garrett. Michaud, okay, to take a, another highly respected writer and poet in France, about the same time, maybe. Um, he went. He was an amazing poet, from what I understand, and, I, and looked at his books. I I can look at his text. The period where he uh, started taking up uh, uh, handwriting, you can really fascinated about about the hand and writing. And he spent years writing book after book after book, where the he, because he was also interested in Chinese calligraphy. And as a poet, there were many poets in that time, French poets, who were interested and fascinated about Chinese. And Chinese lettering and relationship between graph and sign and meaning, etc., and the, the 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 kind of fluid, smooth uh, uh, spectrum between uh, flowing line and character and word and meaning. And he spent years writing these books where you look at it, it just squiggles. And sometimes in the early part, it looks sort of like vaguely like Chinese characters, and then it becomes more and more squiggles and watery, and then. It later on, it started to turn into more like Chinese characters again. And then after that, he went back to writing poems in French. That's not a writer. And his creative procedure was to turn himself from a poet into a drawer. And it was effective for him. Let's see. Sorry, Gary. Yeah, no, just to piggyback on this topic here, I think what is interesting about your own uh, method is not actually the poetry itself, but the decision to work in this sort of way. The same way in which Duchamp's toilet was a work of art once and couldn't be reproduced now in some ways. So I, I want to sort of parallel that with um, <clears throat> this exhibition that took place 50 years ago of artworks called Cybernetic Serendipity. Um, this is also funded by the Department of Defense and so on and so forth to make these technologies known to people and sort of humanize them in some ways. Of course, the uh, in area. In any case, this notion of serendipity is, I think, different than what we see with William Burroughs in some ways, right? What the serendipity was for people to come and bring into this uh, exhibit was that they saw something there. They recognized something. And this was, for them, uh, meaningful, right? They recognized something. And I think maybe part of what the project here is, to the Shinwei's alluding to, is actually to push towards another sort of understanding of thought, which is not only based on recognition. And we could look to um, yeah, I think that I think I'm like also understanding my understanding of the way that Burroughs work is that actually when those things were sort of randomly uh, juxtaposed, that it wasn't the random juxtaposition that made it poetic, but the recognition that the composition of meaning had been changed. So it actually the the leap of like poetic meaning in the words were not actually available to the reader whatsoever to the, the kind of algorithm of randomness, but that it has to be recognized by somebody who's putting it into a context of meaning. Let me draw attention to this uh, series of co contact improvisation uh, creator practice from a very well-respected dance company. I think it was, I can't remember if it's Spanish or what. Here, Ingrid, oh, here it is, here's the beginning. Okay, and what's 
this is contact who's who's done a little bit of I don't know movement work in art I mean in dance or uh, theater okay so you, you'll be very familiar right because anybody who's done a little bit of theater or dance will have done something similar to this kind of exercises and what's beautiful about this work is that they look at it in the beginning they're, they're always working in groups right this person is limp and they're helping the person become somatically sensitive to herself by first assisting the movement and then making the person weightless, for example, and the limbs. I'm just reading out what I'm seeing, okay? And later on, uh, pressing back to the body, I guess in this case, like knowing where your body ends a little bit, you know, where, where it ends and helping them. But if you're a dancer, you can say more precisely. Um, I actually teach most of these movements in my workshops. Um, Curtis, you probably recognize some of this stuff. Uh, there's a few different things happening. One is related to touch, for sure. And Around it. One comes from the Kuchu gymnastics, which is to like let water flow through your body as a way of moving instead of using musculature. Um, a lot of times we're practicing ideas of release. Um, so people are afraid to, to fall, right? And the deeper you go into this practice, the more you realize that you can actually throw yourself across the floor um, without harming yourself because you practice this these techniques of release. What I'm proposing is these are all modes of thought, and these are creative practices. Very, very, very different from the very narrow sort of techniques that uh, those of us who are outside these kinds of areas uh, think of when you think about computers and art. And part of my observation is that there's kind of a, how do you say, hyper, hypostatization of uh, creative techniques, uh, such as Ulipo, right? Uh, under the impact of the prevalence of computers. When in fact, if you look at actual art practices and creative practices, there's a universe of practices that are not visible to those of us who are coming from computers when we try to talk about creative practice. Okay, This is very rigorous work. This is incredibly rigorous work, I will say. And even to my eyes, you can see the steady progression of more and more sophisticated thought. This is thought, actually. But it's not done in words, it's not done in numbers, it's certainly not done in computational form. Okay, so I'm going to work on these kinds of examples some more. Come back. Okay, this is very rigorous work. And then, then there's a performance, so you can see this being worked into a performance. Okay, okay. gesture. This brings into gesture mechanism. Okay, next section I want to talk about is gesture mechanism. Uh, okay, and speed up. I should, I'll, I'll speed up. Okay, so, okay. Uh, so uh, Birdsong in Creative Evolution has a wonderful passage where he talks about <clears throat> he talks about uh, pouring some iron filings onto let's say a table and you brush I, I, I love this example so I must have used it 20 times here so you brush your hand you put your hand down the iron filings and you brush your hand through iron filings and you lift okay so the question is um, and you look at the mark that's left on the table and you ask how did that come to be so if you're, if you're uh, uh, kind of a physics person, you would say, well, uh, look at all the point-by-point -point, uh, contacts, all the point-by-point -point local interactions, particle to particle to particle, and they, they can use physics to say what's going on. See, and then, but you say, well, but you can do that, but it would not explain the final shape. It will explain only local interaction. It does not explain the final shape. Second, if you're, if you're more teleological would say, well, that was the intention of the person to make that shape. I said, no, that's not how I made it. My procedure was to go like this and then let go, not to make that shape. That shape, however, that shape is definite. So this little parable by Bergson is extremely useful, I think. In fact, that was the point, to say that most of the marks that we make, whether it's this kind of mark with the body or even his other example, the digging of a canal. <laughs> by lots of bodies of machines, is in this form. It's neither explainable by mechanism nor is explainable by telos, actually. Okay, so it's super interesting. And just think of that example carefully, we'll find lots and lots of ways to see how computational models are entirely inadequate.
to do with that. So this is another thing to bookmark. Okay. It's a lot in there, I think. Um, they use Bergson and other people use the word canalization, uh, channeling. Okay, that 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 uh, we're not ignoring physics or, but that that action is canalized, whether collective action or individual action is is channeled or conditioned by all sorts of factors, such, such as physics, let's say. Okay, um, but it's not determined, okay. and the, there's a cone, infinite cone of possible results within constraint set up by physics. Super interesting, okay? In fact, we use computers this way in our laboratory, in Topological Media Lab and now Synthesis Center, is that we're using computers to set up those kinds of channelings, actually, right? The condition, the space of what could possibly happen. Uh, all right, so that's one comment. Another comment um, is that um, in the case of this essay I wrote a long time ago called Resistance is Fertile, about gesture in topological situations, um, one of the proposals I made as a working definition for gesture is it's that movement that elicits a response. That gesture, as opposed to just any old activity, gesture is movement that evokes a response. And this is a very, I think, ample, it's, adequate, it's enough to get us going to distinguish certain kinds of movement from movement that we would consider accidental or completely unintentional. Um, uh, it does mark certain kinds of movement, but also it doesn't require us to, uh, to bind too much of particular cognitive support, uh, interpretation of movement, or even to a certain model subjectivity, et cetera, et cetera. And then I found from Harry Smoke, uh, one of my former PhDs, Morris Peckham, and who was in conversation with an American pragmatist who talked about sign that the meaning of any sign is, or we can say nowadays biosemiotic uh, mark, the meaning of any sign is its response, the response to that sign, right? So these are very fertile ways of thinking about marks. And you can see how that's a challenge to, to the earlier model about Turing tapes, or Turing machine tapes, right? That the meaning of the mark is all in that mark already. This is the positivist approach. So it's interesting, if you follow that out, that means it's always deferred. And we know this. I mean, this is, this is kind of 50-year-old news in literary circles, this, this kind of thinking. Right? So we don't require radical new theories to make this kind of point. It's, it, but it would be interesting to think more carefully about the implications for some of the uh, different interpretations of interpretation. <laughs> right? So it's quite interesting. Um, um, so that's mechanism, and I'll skip this part on fields. I did it today earlier in the, in the, in the, in the, in the seminar. OK, so there's that. And then my final section is on organism and golem. So you can see this becomes progressively more. Oh, maybe I'll play this too for fun before I go there. In this case, uh, this is, uh, I'll, I'll show a lot more if I can, if I have a second chance while I'm here this week but of the kind of work we do with computers and computational media, but always in the sense of response, is where, in this case, it's a very very um, uh, basic uh, instrument that we use over and over again, where uh, this is a scrim. So you see yourself at life size, or maybe slightly more, and every single pixel is, can be delayed by a different amount, okay? by now standard technique. But, the, the, but which, which pixels are delayed by which amounts, that is conditioned by a second stream of video, a second, or a second bitmap. That bitmap can be a grayscale image. So let's say black means current time, and white means the deepest past that you can hold in your mem computer memory. Okay. And that gives us a infinite, an infinite, many, many, many ways to, uh, um, how do you say, dope or condition the uh, latency of what you see, latency of the screen, okay? And part of this has to do with actually getting away from that screen, okay? It has to do more with reorienting the, the body, the self, to not thinking of yourself as one time, right? And th also thinking of your movement as somehow splayed out in time so that 
And furthermore, we can make it so that your movement, your degree of movement, can be used to index into time, for example. Even more, we can set up techniques for, here you go, it's where, 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 where um, movement in space turns into a geometry, or I shouldn't say geometry, into an action, which is not in the physical space, right? Just merely by, so these are, there's many, many things we can do with that, okay? And this is very simple, based on the techniques that we have, okay? But what is this? This is writing, what is this, you know? This is writing, this is movement, this is thought. And this is a crutch. This is just a way to attune the person, okay? And at some point, we'd like to be able to take it away and then still play with temporalities this way. So it gives you an idea of what we can do with computation. If we give up this uh, conceit that we want to use it to represent or to uh, uh, do language, I mean, in terms of, you know, like uh, English and Japanese and Chinese, for example. Okay, so I pause and keep on going. My last section is on the golem, about the golem. Any comments, questions so far? On mechanism? Okay. okay. So, golem. Uh, I don't have as much to say directly. I, I, I canceled a lot of the parts here. But the thing is, I, I wanted to play a little bit more. I'm not a historian. I, I would like to talk to some people who may have looked at this more. But I figured golem rather than zombie I'm um, thinking about Golem in particular because, um, you know, for, according to the, the legend of um, the, the Jewish legend, he, is that um, the Golem was the creature that was uh, brought to life, to, but to, you could, in some stories, to defend right, uh, the, the community. There are other stories where it's an inimical, inimical character, but the key thing is that the Golem has the outward form of the human. Um, and even can act in certain ways that are human-like, but internally it's made of mud. It's made of brute and inert matter. The, the, the Newton's phrase, that matter is brute and inert. And that's the monstrosity, right? That it has no interior life, it has no internal consciousness. Right? So in AI circles, there's this thing called zombie theory, right? Maybe you've heard of that. And AI people love to, at least maybe 30 years ago, they like to go around debating with each other, are we all zombies? Meaning, do we or do we not have material consciousness? And, and, and this came about maybe 20 years ago because at that point, the old AI project of building robots that had internal consciousness was foundering. <laughs> so they could actually build machines that could exhibit what you could think of as having internal consciousness. So they thought, oh, well, well maybe none of us have internal consciousness. <laughs> 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 Typical move. <laughs> Declare success and move on. <laughs> so zombie theory. And then Jaron Lanier said that the only people who believe zombie theory are zombies. <laughs> so it's Jaron's thing. So Golem. Um, Longo, Joseph de Longo, uh, who's in Paris, has uh, said a very, um, I think, very uh, interesting provocations where he talks about biological organisms and how biology does not reduce to physics and physics does not even reduce to other physics. That is thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, e and M, field theory, they do not reduce to one another, actually. You cannot kind of reduce all this kind of physics, that kind of physics. So even physics does not reduce to physics. So we should not expect biology to reduce chemistry and chemistry to reduce to, uh, to physics, okay, first of all. So this kind of reductive project doesn't work even in the sciences. First point. Second point is that there are fundamental differences in how organisms, biological living organisms, work inside them. And I don't have time here, but I want to present uh, a, a bunch of these things that follow through on some of the ways in which metabolic organisms actually function quite differently in ways that can never be done computationally, I claim. There's, there's different ways to do that. So Longo and Mayo Monteville in France have been they wrote an amazing book called Perspectives on Organism, which is, somebody's read, some people have read this book. Yes, yeah, great. Perspectives. By um, Longo. Amazing book. Okay. And uh, I don't know what, what the time is. I better start to wrap up. I hope. Um, 
the ways in which organisms are, are somehow in, essentially different from, from uh, physics and from awkward computational systems. And one of the ways they can go down, one path for that is to look at, for example, as an example, just one example, is how water molecules work inside the cell. That is, water molecules, the quantum state of water molecules, the spin state of water molecules, apparently, in the, in, in near a cell membrane is different. I think it's more correlated than water molecules in free bulk water, actually. And I looked up all the articles, not all, I looked up a bunch of articles where they're doing the, um, the wet chemistry of cells, okay? And lo and behold, there's a lot, and now, by now, the evidence is actually pretty overwhelming because they can describe very precisely how it's different. And these are quantum mechanical effects, okay? You don't pick this up by computers. It's very interesting. Why? It turns out because that's how um, uh, certain um, molecules can penetrate the membrane. So it makes the membrane porous in certain ways under certain requirements. It's fascinating. Okay. So if you talk about A-life, it's a joke, right? It's a joke. They don't come anywhere close to modeling this kind of complexity. It's not even complexity. It's a different order of process. They're not computable processes. Sure. Uh, that's one example. Another example comes from neuroscience. So we look at neural networks, right? And I don't know, but we need to find a way to retire that term. Of course, it won't be retired because it has such, such marketing power, which gets to the final part. But if you look at, it's, it's very interesting to look at the neuroscience, to look at the, the neuro. And I was looking, I've been looking at glial networks. And these are the connected, what used to be thought as connective tissues, right? But they actually have serve certain interesting uh, functions that connect across. Another is, um, what was it? Looking at the electrochemical transmissions of signals. Um, they used to be thinking, what is it called? Axons and dendrites. They, they thought that they go like this, and signals could pass from one to the other. But it's been very interesting work. I think it was Columbia looking at cross communication, uh, where it's mediated, mediated by chemicals as well as by electrical gradient. As soon as we talk about chemical and electrical gradient, we're no longer in a computable domain. Okay, we can model some sort of things, but because these are fields, these are field structures, field structures, actually. In fact, there's just if, again, if you talk about a life and neural networks, talk about neural networks. A neural network, to remind, uh, we don't have the time here, is simply a sum of piecewise linear functions with some coefficients. So that structure bears no resemblance to what's going on here in, in terms of the wet chemistry. No resemblance, really no resemblance. There are people who are trying to do mathematical models of what's going on here. But the mathematics for that are orders of magnitude different than, entire different order than the mathematics used in neural networks, first of all. And I mean, probably people have said this many times before, but it's always in passing, and then they go on and keep on using the term neural networks. So if you repeat this long enough, people start to think that, ah, we're building thinking machines. Okay. Then the, uh, the repulse to that would say, well, there's more than one way to think. Yeah. Which brings up to the final point, which is why do AI at all? Why do AI at all? So I'll pass by some intermediate stuff. But there are several reasons, OK? And by AI, we include good old-fashioned AI, which is natural language processing, building an entity or machine that can um, pass the Turing test, OK? Uh, can converse with us in some ways. Another would be pattern recognition techniques, another which includes like SVMs and neural networks, et cetera. Another would be statistical methods. And a final method would be brute force table lookup which actually is mostly what it goes on today. <laughs> like the translation programs of Siri, uh, they're mostly brute force table lookups. You know, uh, you, you, send the mich you send the server up in the sky a string or an audio file or something, and it, uh, it doesn't match, and then it gives you back the stored result. It's just table lookup. You look at Eliza, the famous Eliza program. Remember the Eliza program, you communicate with it. You look up the actual code, the, mathematic the mathematical code is basically 10 lines. It's a table lookup. Mention mother, do this. Mention uncle, do this. You know, so it's very it's very funny. Um, those are brute force. Turns out that in the case of 
before I ask the question why again. In the case of the table lookup, you say, hey, but these things are doing very good. They're very effective. And uh, I'll remind you of two things. One is John Searle's Chinese Room. Remember this famous uh, case from, philosophy, from analytic philosophy? The Chinese Room is the following. It's that uh, don't look inside. It's a box. Don't look inside. OK, it's a box. <laughs> <laughs> I should know better than to do that. Uh, OK, so look over on the outside. And then you uh, write some Chinese characters or type some Chinese characters, slip it into the slot, and out comes responses in Chinese. And lo and behold, you can have a conversation with this box. Amazing. For every response, you get another, for every input, you get a response which makes sense. And then you open the box, you find somebody who knows nothing, knows no Chinese, okay? No Chinese at all. And all he has to do is follow these instructions on the right hand side. It's a, not even reading, it's just squiggly, you know, recognizing squiggles. For this squiggle, put down that squiggle and send it out to shoot. John Searle, this is one of his famous examples, and he said, does, and he asked, does this box know Chinese? And of course, the expected answer is, of course not, it doesn't, okay? And this is meant to be a refutation of this idea of, of, of intelligence um, being, um, how do you say, that an adequate uh, test of intelligence or consciousness, I should say, is input-output. For, in, for every input you put in, you get the right output out. And that's enough to constitute consciousness inside. The ironic thing is that today, this very technique <laughs> is a stand-in for intelligence. Isn't that ironic? 30 years later, the refutation itself is the technique by which people write programs that we, to which we ascribe intelligence. In popular discourse. Okay. I'll skip this last part for next time. Um, so why? What do you think? So here are some, here are some things I'm thinking kind of obvious. Uh, uh, one reason for doing this is scientific. Reason for creating artificial intelligence is, is scientific, machine intelligence, so to speak, is scientific, to better understand the structures of intelligence. You know, other models of consciousness. That's fine. That's interesting, OK? Uh, of course, another reason would be to create slaves, right? This is what Marvin Minsky said when he came to Concordia University about eight years ago, one of the gods of computer science, of AI. He came, and he gave a talk about you know, his, his great modular, modular mind um, uh, uh, model for AI. And he also named the big problems of society that AI could help tackle, like war and food secure, insecurity, stuff like that and labor shortages and stuff like that. Uh, and then at the end of the talk, so, uh, a computer scientist asked him, so how does your model relate to the big problems challenging society? And so well, remember, one of my uh, big problems was uh, questions of labor. We want to, we have too many people doing stupid jobs, okay? So we don't want all these people you know, leaving dead in their lives. So instead, we would like to build a machine that's about the equivalent of a five-year-old so that that machine can do those jobs, et cetera, et cetera, things like that. Um, uh, and so, well, what about the people who are being put out of work? And so we don't have to worry about those people. They're just immigrants. You know? And then the room was full of immigrants. <laughs> this is engineering, right? So 90% were from Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, et cetera. Okay? The room went dead quiet, dead quiet. Um, and one person said, you know, do you mean to say, finally said, they were shocked and said, do you mean to say that there's no rational thought in these uh, countries, in other countries, I mean, from where they're coming from. And he said, he paused and said, yes, yes. So, so this gives you a little bit of a window into some of the kinds of thought going on behind. Say, we want certain kinds of workers. These workers are unruly, so let's replace them by less, ruly, less unruly workers. It's really right there, right? So the question would be, that's the economic reason. It's obvious, it's obvious. So one of the big challenges for us here is how do we respond to this question beyond Elon Musk's uh, solution, which is to give everybody basic income? Okay, but it doesn't actually, it, it can help us materially, right? But the logic is still that most of humanity is not necessary anymore. That's the problem. In fact, 
mostly humanity is considered a cost, not, an ass, not a production of value, not a producer of value. That's the problem. It's a cost. Okay. In Chinese, there's a phrase called tian cai, oh, sorry, which means like genius. There's another phrase, which is ren cai, right, which means human, human value. Okay. So I think we need to urgently have a discussion what was the fundamental value of humans other than being productive. It's not that logic. Um, and uh, an another, another, another motivation uh, could be uh, this desire to make a being, to make a being. Okay. And um, I would say that, uh, that, well, okay, this is a provocation. Um, it would be interesting to look at who are the AI people, demographics. You know, who are the actual, what are the actual demographics of AI researchers and engineers? And I'm sure that's well known. Just look it up somewhere. Okay. And, and we think about, you know, then how many of these are the kind of human beings who can make babies? It would be interesting to look at that. Now, I'm not one of those kinds of humans, but I do have two children, and now two and a half, let's say. Um, uh, and I have to say that this desire to make a being is, of course, you know, it's very fundamental, actually. And having had a hand in raising uh, one child who's now grown up and another child who's growing up now, <coughs> there's nothing that compares with that kind of complexity and richness, you know, the miracle of raising a child. A being, you know, nothing, nothing, right? So all these algorithms, these techniques, these little tricks here and there, engineering tricks, they don't compare. No comparison. So it makes me wonder, why do these, all these projects want to make beings? Why are you making beings? 